Good evening. This is a school board workshop, the Scarborough Board of Education. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Ms. Hartle? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. New Business 5.0, 5.1, the minutes of February 4th, 2016. Will and Board? Move we'll approval is printed. Second. Is there any discussion? Any corrections? We need to move back. Very good. Oh, sorry. Any discussion, any corrections to the minutes? No. Seeing none, all in favor? Seven plus one. 5.2, the middle school athletic appointments. There's one, one appointment as presented. Will of the board? Move approval as presented. Second. Any questions? I have yes. Are there any others for the winter? Uh, I don't know if I see Mr. Legage out there. I'm going to say no. no. Mr. Legage, are, are there any additional winter appointments, Mr. Legage? Thank you. That, that was going to be my answer, too. Thank you. No. Anyone else? All in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. 5.3, we have the selection of the superintendent screening committee participants. Uh, we let the community know that we will be selecting parents from three different groups representing the different uh, grade levels in our schools. So, um, Dr. Miles, would you like to go back here and... That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> select the uh, one from each basket and then if you could kindly announce them this evening on the microphone. K through five. Yep. We have uh, Rick Davies. Rick Davies. Uh, six through eight. Kristen Allen. Kristen She's Allen. here tonight. <laughs> Congratulations, Kristen, you won. <laughs> And 9-12. Wesley Franklin. Wesley Franklin. Very good. Thank you. And 6.0 is our workshop session. I want to welcome our guests this evening, as well as uh, all those community members who have decided to join us. This is a regular school board workshop. Our guests tonight include Representatives Siraki, Vashon, and McLean, Senators Millette and Volk, State Finance Director Suzanne Bowden, and former Education Commissioner Jim Breyer. Thank you for joining us. For the past five years, the school board, in preparation for the budget season, has invited our local legislators to our board workshop to discuss what is currently happening in Augusta with regards to education funding. Given that this is a regular school board meeting, members of the public will have a chance to listen in on our dialogue with our legislators. And then they will be given the opportunity to speak if they wish to do so. Here is how we'll proceed this evening. First, the board will have an hour to ask questions and engage our legislators on topics important to the board. Following the hour, we will allow about 15 to 20 minutes for audience members to come to the mic and make any comments they wish to make. 
This will not be time for back and forth discussion, but rather a comment time. Following that, we will take a five minute break to allow people who wish to leave to do so, and the school board will finish its meeting. In order to make efficient use of our time with legislators, I'm asking the board members to first be recognized by the chair and to ask your question or to make your comment as you wish. All questions and comments are to be directed through the chair first. Please identify whether you have a comment or a question and to whom you wish to direct that. Let's get started. Nearly all the same board members who are here tonight were present last year with the same legislators. And we thoroughly discussed the EPS formula. While there may still be some questions about the EPS formula, that's not the focus for this evening's meeting. The focus is that we really want to talk about what's going on in Augusta and how you can help us support this town and our students and our teachers. Uh, we are really interested in that and hearing how you can support us on behalf of the town. I'll start the questioning and this goes to our legislators. The state paid $450,000 to PICUS Associates to provide a direction the state should take to improve education funding in Maine. Now, apparently, we do have some additional funds that may be available to offset some of the educational costs at the local level. Among those PICUS recommendations was an increase increasing education spending by about 227 million a year. Universal pre-K, lower class sizes in elementary schools. Employ mentors for teachers and specialists who work with struggling students. Increase funding for gifted and talented. Increase staff development by five days each year with possible funds now available. What PICUS recommendations are you committed to support? Who would like to begin? Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll you ran no answers? Quickly. You ran through those really quickly. I started taking notes. So I got as far as universal pre-K and increasing staff development by five sure. days a year. Let me re re uh, repeat them. $227 million a year additional in funding. Universal pre-K. Lower class sizes in elementary school. Employ mentors for teachers and specialists who work with struggling students. Increase funding for GT, gifted and talented. Increase staff development days for by five days a year. What possible, with, with the possible funds that are now available, what PICUS recommendations are you con committed to support? Yeah. Senator Miller. I think I can take a stab, initial stab. Okay. Um, so yes, those were the recommendations of the PICUS report. Following those recommendations, the Special Commission on School Funding uh, reviewed each and every section and recommendation of, of that report and came up with a list of priorities. The f first one was early education, the pre-K. Yep, my apologies. Yeah. Um, the first priority was uh, early education pre-K. And it went on from there. I actually, it's just been long enough where I don't think I could reproduce the actual order. But the critical element that came up time and time again from those who are serving on the commission, from the um, state, uh, the board of education members, the superintendents, um, and teachers was that before we expanded existing programs, and change the EPS formula, which could result in increased local expenses, 
the number one priority of that commission was getting the state to 55% before we did anything. Because there was a recognition that if we, if we indeed recognize that additional 200 plus million dollars in educational expenses that the state was not recognizing in the essential program and services model, there would be a significant additional local share cost that we knew our communities could not shoulder. Mm -hmm. So we added language in every section saying, we support pre-K, early childhood, professional development, uh, extended learning opportunities, et cetera, but only after the state supports the cost of education at the required, led statutorily required, 55%. Thank you, Senator. Anyone else wish to respond? I, I do yes. have one comment. On the early, on the early childhood education piece, mm -hmm. um, about 50% of the school districts in the state now offer preschool, public preschool, and in the town of Scarborough, in my district, I would be very concerned about that because we have so many really high quality, good private preschools, and I think it may put them out of business. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Senator Millet. So I'm just <coughs> going to provide some clarification to the early childhood public pre-K. Um, we included language um, in, the, in the commission uh, report to the legislature. Um, and actually, I believe it's in statute. Um, uh, I, I, let me just say, yeah, it's actually in statute that um, efforts to support and develop public pre-K would be done in partnership with our private child care providers because we recognize that it is an important um, business, uh, lo small businesses across the state, um, and many of them are very high quality, and we want them to participate with us. So, in fact, um, there is there is every recognition of their role and is an essential part of anything we would do going forward. If there's no one else, anyone else wishing to speak? No? Okay, let's move on. Yes. Um, Do you have a question yeah, or a comment? It jumps off the 55 percent. Um, I have a question. And I'm not sure if um, Mr. Ryer would be the best one to answer this because he was there when this happened, but mm -hmm. for those who don't know, the 55 percent that we keep talking about is that the voters mandated that the state should pick up the tab for 55 percent of public education in Maine, and it's never happened. And so my question is, what were the discussions in Augusta when this was became a mandate from the voters? And what happens every year at budget season to just, I mean, it's, it has never happened. So I guess I'm wondering what is the what is the conversation and what are the legalities surrounding the failure to fund at 55 percent? Uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, when the law, when that passed that you're referring to in 2004, there was a path set in place by the legislature after that passage which would have allowed five years for that to occur. In other words, it was uh, a certain percentage in the first year and then it would reach 50, 55 percent by the fifth year of that, and that would have been 2010. Um, as you're all well aware, uh, in 2008 and 9 especially, things changed dramatically, um, and that's the point where the state, and for many other reasons, started to um, not meet that kind of ramp up requirement, if you want to call it that. And since that time, 2010 and the years since, the legislature has looked at and known what it costs to get to 55 percent, but ultimately have made the decision not to provide the resources to do that. Um, that is something, as I understand it, something the legislature can decide to do each year and have that goal still there but not be mandated to reach the 55 in any given year. Um, that's about all I can, if you have more questions, I can they can maybe answer them, but since 2009, it's been a. It, well, there was a significant slide in 10, 11, and 12, and then the state started providing more, nowhere near 55 at that point, but provided more general purpose aid to local schools, beginning in that 2011 year of about 888 million. It's now at 985 million in this particular year we're in now. 
Yes, Jody, is it a question, question or a comment? I have a question. Okay, go to her. Um, and it sort of piggybacks on all of this. The underlying current that I'm hearing is that we need more funding. The PICUS report said that. Um, I think emails that we've received, um, the way for us to get to that 55 plus is to invest in education. So I guess my, my first question is a very simple question in that are you all willing to advocate in Augusta to get us to that 55 percent? Rebecca, I guess. Anyone <laughs> willing to speak? <laughs> um, so I, I can only speak for myself um, and my experience uh, to date. Mm -hmm. So uh, m my first term, I had the privilege and honor of serving as the, education, the Senate Education Chair. Um, <clears throat> and we worked very hard, uh, the Democratic Caucus did, to advocate for increased state funding for public school education beyond the governor's recommendation. And in fact, um, in the end, through the bipartisan budget, that was achieved. The last, um, this past session, when we worked on the bipartisan budget, <clears throat> We had notification from the department that there was a significant increase in the cost of education. And by our calculations and everybody else's, an additional $60 million needed to be raised in order to keep the mill rate constant. Is that correct, Ms. Bowden? Yes. Um, and so as, again, a Democratic caucus, we advocated to the Appropriations Committee that in the end makes these decisions for an additional $60 million to try to keep that mill rate constant. Our Republican colleagues on the committee advocated for $40 million because they recognized that this was a huge jump in education costs and if the, if, if the um, towns were asked to cover that, it would result in some um, very difficult property tax increases. In the end, the biennial budget included $20 million per year of the biennium. Um, so it did not come close to covering that additional amount. And as a result, you all had to deal with those consequences. Mm -hmm. Now, when we passed that additional $20 million per biennium, it sounded great. We all were like, well, at least we got more money. Woohoo. But then you reflect back and you're like, ah, we flat funded it. But in reading, in <laughs> my bedtime reading, the Maine Education School statutes um, and talking with others, we do flat fund that first year for the second year because every year up until fairly recently, the governor has provided a supplemental budget because we have to balance the budget every year and we have new education cost forecasts and we are then supposed to make adjustments at that. So actually by statute, um, we are actually waiting to receive from the department what the new educational cost forecast will be, and I believe we're going to be receiving that information very soon. Um, and then um, uh, we're charting some new unch uncharted territory as, as a committee, but I believe we'll receive that information, and then we're going to try to figure out how we can convey that to the Appropriations Committee and request that this additional cost, or at least I, I believe from our caucus decision, we will ask for that additional cost to be um, funded by the state. And I've advocated in, in my caucus, so the way things work in Augusta, it's very much committee driven and it's also somewhat caucus driven. So um, every morning we meet with our caucus, so Republicans meet with Republicans and we meet, we go over what we're going to do for the day and we talk about any issues that are occurring. And, you know, likewise it happens on the other side of the aisle. And I've been very clear in my caucus that finding the $23 million to fill this gap is very important to me in my district and um, to the students in, in Scarborough, Gorham, and Buxton. So I'm still hopeful that um, we're going to find a vehicle to be able to vote for that. Anyone at this, Andrew? Can I jump in? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I appreciate um, everyone being here, especially folks in the audience tonight. I think this is an important issue to talk about. Um, and I think mainly we're here to talk about the 1.5, 1.6 million dollar hole uh, that Scarborough is facing in education funding. That's a significant amount of money. 
um, and it's not something that can easily easily be made up in an increase in property taxes, which is ultimately where it's going to come from unless you cut services. So <clears throat> I think as a legislature, we need to find a way to fill this gap. There, while I think there's probably differences among the five of us about how how we proceed in filling that gap, there is a proposal that uh, is uh, in front of us in the legislature. Um, folks have probably read about the tax conformity package, uh, and there is uh, a proposal alongside of that to add $23 million uh, in additional education funding that would go a long ways towards closing that significant gap that exists. It might not solve the problem in Scarborough or Gorham or Buxton or any other community, but it would certainly go a long way towards filling that gap. So that is a, a proposal that is working its way through the legislature. It's currently sitting in the Senate right now, um, and uh, I, I assume there will be action on it next week. Um, but it's really, really important that we find a way to address that shortfall really quickly, and there is, in fact, a proposal in front of us to do just that. Yes, Representative Ashon. I think it's important for everybody here to understand a little bit because I'm getting the questions of we want to know what's going on in Augusta. So I think it's pretty important that everybody kind of understand how Augusta actually works. Um, there are 16 joint standing committees. And between all of those 16 joint standing committees, we are looking at literally all of the needs of the state of Maine. Tonight, the focus is education. Um, but within your representation here, I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee. So I am hard at work working on the drug bills. I am following what is going on with education. That is not my expertise. Rebecca chairs the education meeting, so she, uh, committee, committee. So she is definitely going to be your your resource to to work on that. Heather's on appropriations. Andrew's on transportation, and Amy, Amy uh, is on LCRED uh, and ju judiciary. So we're all going to be coming at this from a different perspective, mainly from our committees that that we represent, and we're going to have a some are going to have broader knowledge to you than, than our committee. Um, so I am very process oriented in how legislation is brought forward and how the public actually has a voice in the process. So as probably you are, are aware, I ob objected to how tax conformity was, was brought to the floor and it ended up on the floor having an amendment added to it, which was the $23 million for education. Now, normally, I would advocate for a bill to come forward, an education bill to come forward. And the reason why the public wants an education bill to come forward is then, then it will be assigned to a committee to the Education Committee, which is where their level of expertise is. It then has a public hearing, and then, then we all have a chance to vote on it. The, the committee will vote on it out of committee, and then they are, they are your expertise to go to, and the public has a chance to weigh in. That didn't happen on this bill. This amendment came on the floor with a $23 million fiscal note. And anything that has a fiscal note also goes over to appropriations for a public hearing, and then it's worked through, through the committee. So I didn't like the process on it, and I did not support it. I'm not overly comfortable with taking $23 million and putting it toward education because it is coming from essentially Maine's rainy day fund, the stabilization fund, and They've looked at the health, financial health of the state and said, we should have 10 to 15 percent in reserves. We only have 3.3 percent of funds in reserves, which essentially means that if something hits our economy and all of a sudden people cannot buy cars, cannot buy homes, we don't have revenue coming in. And so when you're taking that amount of revenue, it's basically 
eight days of, of revenue and they're saying we should have 30 days of revenue. So while I feel the pain and the pinch of losing $1.5 million in, in our school district, I think we have to look at the overall health and the economy of this. If we fall on challenging times, we've got to find, we've got to find other ways. Um, the, the impact has been, of course, the closure of, of, of the mills. And that, that's what's affecting the, the formula. So as I realize we are at a school board meeting and we are addressing the funding of schools, I want to keep this in perspective that there are many issues all around the state that need to be addressed. And our economy needs to grow. We need to have jobs. And when we talk about going to the state and asking for money, people need to remember that's our money. That's taxpayer money. So I, I just thought I w would put some context to what was going on around this, this table. You're definitely going to have your education people that are going to know a lot more than somebody that is on, on Health and Human Services. And, and normally what we do is go to our experts. We go up to the fifth floor of education. If, if there's a constituent concern, we're going to source our, our people of knowledge that can help us, but I'm, I'm really glad that we have the Department of Education here to help us with this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Millett, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, else? just a couple of clarifications on process. Um, we're, so we're in the second uh, session of this legislature, and we're under different rules this year than we were last year. And so the ability to get a bill in and out of a committee is very different now. And in fact, um, we have to get it through the Legislative Council. And uh, for, at this point in time, um, almost ne next to nothing is getting through that council. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that all of, these, this, all of this discussion should, um, including tax conformity, including education, including health care services, transportation questions, et cetera, should be discussed within the context of, of a supplemental budget. But we're not going to get one. So yes, it's, it's a little unusual to have a, an amendment put on the floor for $23 million, but we are looking for vehicles by which we can have the conversation around how do we meet the new forecasted uh, statewide cost of education increase which would have been presented in the supplemental budget, which, by the way, is required to be presented to the um, legislature, I believe, in early January. Um, I have it somewhere in my notes. But um, so I, obviously in the middle of February, it doesn't look good that we're going to get anything like that. Um, so you know, we're all doing the best that we can to try to address some of the more um, immediate issues before us. And certainly, um, the cost of education that has been the increase in cost of education that has been developed by the department through the essential programs and services model needs to be addressed. It normally is addressed every year of the legislature. Um, and so, from my perspective, uh, I support the idea of trying to address it through the um, tax conformity bill because, in addition, in my mind, uh, providing property tax relief is, is much of a part of the discussion on statewide um, tax policy as tax conformity is. I think it's interesting. There, there are ways around those kinds of things, and I understand, and, and I wish we had a supplemental budget to deal with. I think that, that would make everybody's job easier, and the fact is that um, you know, no one in this room has control over that happening. Um, so you know, I, I don't really feel like that's necessarily something to um, continue to discuss. But we do have some other vehicles in the Education Committee. It's my understanding, I think, that you even sponsored a bill on EPS funding that could, you could tack a committee amendment on to deal with the $23 million gap in the, in the context of the Education Committee and then bring that to the floor so that it's, a, it's at least a little more related subject matter than tax conformity, which came through the Tax Committee. So I'm hoping that that perhaps will serve as the vehicle. We also heard word this morning, excuse me, um, um, that one of the senators, Senator Langley, I think, has a proposal to deal with additional funding separately. So I'm hopeful that that might be a vehicle as well. And I think it's important for everyone to understand here, I, I hear some misinformation sometimes out 
in the hinterlands that um, with this feeling that 55% uh, is how much each individual district would be funded, but that's a statewide average. So we Scarborough that. would never receive 55%. We, we it's, it's through the formula we will receive a percentage, but we're not going to ever, Scarborough would never reach 55% either. And um, and I was discussing the, the fact of changing the 55% number with one of my committee members and and wondering about um, the charge that it's illegal for us not to fund at 55 percent. And, and as Mr. Ryer explained, there was some ramp up history there. And then we had the financial crash in 2008, which dramatically affected um, just state finances in general and the, and the nation as well. And um, so each biennial budget is actually a bill. It's, it, has an L, uh, it has an LD number, it's an actual bill, so it's a legal document. And so legally, you can change um, and amend, repeal, re um, change bills. We do on a, all the time. And unless it's written into the Constitution of the state, um, things can be changed. So we have notwithstanding language to change that percentage depending on how, how much money we have available to provide for funding. It's also my understanding that as part of the language of the original bill that was voted on by the, the voters, and maybe Ms. Bowden or Mr. Ryer could, could speak to this, um, that there's a requirement from uh, in there that the DOE would, the Department of Education would give some kind of an update in December. And as far as I know that that hasn't happened or hasn't been happening, I'm not sure why. But that I think would be helpful for everyone involved to maybe have a little more information a little sooner so that everyone could be um, briefed and know where we're going. And when we look at um, why we haven't been able to meet that 55% benchmark, I also am curious to see the cost drivers. I know special ed costs have gone up tremendously, and yet over the last 10 years we've lost 5,000 special ed students statewide. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about those cost drivers in that, and also I think it's um, support services, that um, budget line has gone way up, and I think Ms. Bowden may have information on that, um, and maybe could um, speak to that to some degree, but there may be some things that we could be looking at statewide that would help control the spending so that we could reach that 55% mark, especially given that in the 1970s, I think we had a student population in the state of about 250,000 students. We're down to, I think, 178,000. I believe that includes the four-year-olds, too, the preschool population, which is new. So we have a tremendous loss in the state of the numbers of students, and yet the, the costs have just gone up exponentially. And so that makes it hard for us to to keep pace with that. Thank okay. you. Um, Jody, do you have a follow-up to that, or is that a new question? A, a few commenters back. I have a comment and then a question, because now we've had a bunch of people. So I have a okay, few so things. We'll go to you, and then we'll be right to you, Jackie, OK? Um, I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> the rainy day fund, I guess I'll start the rainy day fund. The state is projecting a, a surplus this year, and I don't know a better way to say it, but it's raining here in Scarborough. The rainy day is today. Um, we continue to keep losing money, and I feel like education is at the bottom of the barrel. We're going we're gonna to pay back our hospitals because we have an outlying debt to them. Well, there's an outlying debt to the, the education of our students here in the state of Maine, and we continue to get pushed to the bottom. So it's raining. Instead of putting it in the rainy day fund, how about education? Um, we're still funding at a 2008 level. When you look at, if you factor in inflation, we're still, we're still funding education at a 2008 level. We're talking about 2008, that's eight years ago. We, things have changed exponentially. And it's infuriating to sort of continue to hear that while well, we were we had a recession. Yes, and we're coming out of it now, so we need to continue to invest. As we all know, this is the best time to invest in anything as you're coming out of a recession. And my feeling on giving tax breaks to businesses over 
funding education is because businesses build this community. I don't believe that. I, in my depths, believe that people come to a town because of good education. They don't come because a new business moved into town. So I believe that if you invest in education, you get families coming here, you, you see people see families moving to town, businesses actually show up to those towns because there's people living here, investing here, and becoming a community. So if you stop investing in education, you stop seeing businesses come to town. It's the chicken and the egg. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Jackie now. Do you have a question, Jackie, or a comment? I, I have both, and, and uh, it's only the last one that I think you'll be able to answer this evening, but the first two I would hope that you would be able to address before, you, uh, before Election Day. So the first one is this. The comment is, we are one of the wealthiest towns in the state. We send to Augusta eight or nine times the tax money than we ever get back in school subsidy and revenue. Now, I know this from Tom Hall because he spoke to our Kiwanis Club last week. Have you ever considered helping us out by allowing us to keep at least a half of 1% of that revenue would require a bill or allowing us to charge an extra half a percent tax on top of the state tax to stay in town. Second, we have spent over $40 million on school construction within this town in the last 10 years supported by the voters. Because the state did not participate in that process, we bear the entire burden of paying for and maintaining those buildings. Have you ever thought of introducing legislation to change that policy and aiding us in maintaining those buildings? Thirdly, specifically, what have each of you done to ease the local tax burden of our citizens? That's like the one I would like you to answer now. And who wishes to go oh, first? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, in answer to the question of would I support legislation to ask for more money to come back and or put it on the taxpayer, the answer is no, I would not. Um, with regards to the con school construction project, um, we had an opportunity to get state funding for, for the Wentworth School. We just had to wait, and we chose not to. And it, had we had, had waited, this would not have fallen back on the taxpayer. Um, and what was the third question? The third question is specifically, what have each of you done to ease the local tax burden? As I mentioned, I, I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee, and I believe firmly that we should strive always to keep our people whole. And I'm working on the drug addiction bills. When you look at society and their contribu contribution back to society, we want them whole so that they can have jobs and they can pay taxes. So when we consider the interests of all citizens here and the needs that need to be met so that we can make them as healthy as possible, they become tax-paying citizens, and then I have saved you tax dollars. Andrew? Thank you very much. I, I want to touch on a couple things. Jackie, I think those first two ideas that you talked about are worthy of consideration. Um, the, the third piece that I would say, I think there are a number of things, a number of votes that I've taken uh, that have either reduced or prevented, uh, reduced property taxes or prevented a property tax hike. One is uh, uh, not going along with the elimination of revenue sharing that was proposed in the budget last year. Um, that would have been 
a significant, significant impact on local taxpayers. Um, you know, my property taxes went up this year. I happen to be able to, uh, to, be able to afford uh, a 20 or $30 increase, but there are a lot of people who can't. People are tired of pay paying property taxes. Uh, every time I go knock on a door, uh, it is not the income tax, it's not the sales tax that's hurting people, it's the property taxes because people are on a fixed income and they can't afford it. So we have to do everything that we can to keep property taxes down. And I, I just want to touch on a few other things that folks were talking about. I, I'm a big believer in process too, especially when it comes to the legislative process. I think it's important. Um, I think we need to pay attention to the process. Ultimately, you all are creating your school budget right this very minute. Gorm's doing it. Communities across the state are doing it right now. I don't think there's time to wait. I think you all need to know uh, how much money the state is going to be contributing uh, because you need to put that budget together right now. So we can talk all we want about process. The process that we have, that, that we have put forward right now, and I know some folks disagree, but the amendment that was attached to the tax conformity bill provides $23 million in additional educational funding. We can argue about process all we want, but I'm guessing that the most important thing to you is that you get the money. Um, so that's what's most important to me. That's what I've been hearing from folks about. Um, I don't think that, that there's any time to waste. I think towns across the state are reeling from this potential cut. Um, uh, on top of that, the, the mandates and the, the costs that the state has been pushing off to cities and towns is just too much. So in the end, we need to, need to do uh, everything that we can as quickly as we can to get towns like Scarborough uh, the money so that they can keep property taxes down this year. Um, Amy, so did you? Yeah, I just wanted to and answer Jackie's in. question. Mm -hmm. Amy and then Heather. I know you're waiting, Heather. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead. It's okay. um, so we actually, uh, I think, um, in the 126th legislature, there was a proposal for a local option sales tax, which I did um, support. I have been very well known for my efforts on tax reform, and one of the things that that involved was uh, the ability to control, better control property taxes through increasing some of our sales and service taxes. Um, unfortunately, we came pretty close, but we were ultimately unsuccessful in getting that passed. Um, I've also been really active on economic development in the state, and that's, you know, Karen Bashan talked about, you know, we sort of live in our world of our committees, and I'm on the Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development Committee. We, we oversee the Department of Economic and Community Development, which, by the way, we were talking before this meeting, you know, has gone from a department that at one point employed around 80 people to now I think there's maybe 35 <coughs> people in that department. It's been slashed. Um, we do not have much in the way of economic development programs in this state. And ultimately, that's very sad, and we're all paying the price of these continuous budget crises and um, job growth that seems to be fairly stagnant statewide. We don't necessarily see that down here in southern Maine because we live in the part of the state that is the most prosperous. Um, the other piece of that is that you know, we have passed some significant tax cuts that we've been very much criticized for, but we we're just talking about the fact that we have a $65, $67 million surplus. So those tax cuts have ultimately actually resulted in an increase in revenue, which is precisely why we advocate for tax cuts. Um, lastly, you know, we in this country and in this state in particular have all collectively decided that socialized education is the way that we deliver education to our children, that all children, no matter where they live or what their parents do for work or what their community's uh, property valuation is, deserve to have an adequate education. And so that's why we see that towns such as Scarborough, which are very prosperous, which um, can afford to help out the rest of the state, <coughs> are ultimately doing that. And so, you know, when our um, neighbors, so to speak, in Bucksport and in Millinocket and in Lincoln, where I have a lot of family, are hurting, we're going to feel that hurt too. 
but those kids deserve an education. And I feel very passionately about that. And um, I think that that is something that we as a society have agreed for a very long time is the way that it should be. Okay. And Heather. Um, I would just like to say also that the last biennial budget, we did increase education spend spending by $83 million. And a lot of people have referenced the Maine Municipal Association's February 12th bulletin and their, uh, rec their evaluation that $20 million a year would be needed to just flat fund. So with, if you're following that logic, that $60 million, $20 million in the first year of the biennium and 40 the next year because you're adding 20 each year would have flat funded. So with 83, we're 23 million ahead <coughs> of that already. And because of the mill closures, which we all knew were coming, it was just a matter of time. It's unfortunate that we had five of them close. That dramatically affected, I, I believe to the tune of about a billion dollars, hit on property valuation in this state. That is a tremendous property valuation hit. And so to absorb that is factored into that EPS formula. And if we put $23 million in, <coughs> it's not going to be funneled out only to the communities like Scarborough that received a cut. It's going to mean a large slice go goes to Bucksport and it's going to mean a tiny slice comes to Scarborough because that's the formula. So I, I just hope that people understand that even if the legislature does ultimately make the decision to increase by another $20 million money going into this formula, Scarborough is going to be receiving a small slice and I, I would like to ask Ms. Bowden, has the DOE run any preliminary numbers all based on this? I, I think she might be able to answer no, that better. No, we than have me. not. Um, How long does it take to run through this process and with all these variables? I'm still working on our numbers right now. We're, the numbers that are out are preliminary. We're still working on uh, refining those. Um, so at this point in time, they're not going to be run with an additional $23 million. Um, it, it's a, a tough process to, because of a lot of data coming from all the school districts and we're refining some of those because some districts have looked at their printouts and found that they had some data reported incorrectly. So we're fixing some of those items at this point in time. So. Okay. Rebecca, did you want to respond? So, so um, I just wanted to follow up one more thing. So with the $83 million in this previous biennium that we've already put into um, additional aid, and looking at the $300 million in additional spending that, that occurred in this, pre this past budget as well, to add more money into the baseline would bump it up, if we did the 23, would be up at $106 million for the biennium <coughs> for state funding. So those are all factors that we keep in mind on my committee because we have so many underfunded and um, needy programs that also need prioritization. So this is not, nothing about this is easy. We have a limited amount of money. The $67 million or whatever that we're projected to be over um, with the new revenue forecast is a one-time wonder. It's not projected in the out years. We're projected to have five in the, in the out years. So committing that much extra spending just requires also an adjustment in how we appropriate all the money. So these are factors that our committee um, has to factor in as well. So when, when the bill is ultimately voted on, we have to figure that piece out. Okay, thank you. Senator Merlet? Thank you. Uh, there's a lot to, a lot of things that are swirling in my head. Just a couple of points, and it's really, it's, it's really important to be very clear. Um, Rep uh, Representative Siraki did not actually quite correctly reflect what the essential programs and services model is, does not have anything to do with the state valuation. That's the allocation methodology. There are two distinct processes. And it's, import and that is, it's important for people to understand that because the essential program and services model is legislated in statute as, as the base amount that is required to, to support public education throughout the state of Maine. It is not reflective of anything that local communities spend above 
what has been determined to be the essential program and services in education. So um, I actually find it a tad offensive when people refer to education budget as being bloated or um, increasing exponentially, um, when in fact it is a result of a calculation done by the Department of Education and not a reflection of actual spending that each district has been engaged in. And even with all of that in mind, since 2008 and 9, the cost of education has increased by an average of 1.6% annually. That's not, that's not, uh, that's not reflective of some, uh, some, some, I'm sorry, some ways people would characterize education spending in the state of Maine. Um, we did pass tax reform in this biennium budget. Um, we provided tax relief to the um, middle class families. We um, increased the support through the Homestead Exemption Act. Um, I'm sorry, <coughs> Homestead Exemption and the Property Tax Relief Payer Program. And those are actually really important um, partner to the education funding process that we go through. And it was, ref it was discussed in the PICUS report. Um, net net what they told us was that as a state we're doing actually a pretty good job in terms of funding education and, and if we care about funding education in an equitable manner. In other words, no matter where you live in the state of Maine, you will have an equal shot at getting a quality education no matter um, what your town circumstances or your family circumstances are. Um, but that there's a recognition that the, the, one, of the, one of the effects of this allocation methodology, which is separate from the essential programs and services model, is that there are communities like Scarborough um, and like um, up around Moosehead Lake and others where there's um, very valuable waterfront property and they get an undue, um, it, it's, that is used as a measure of an ability to pay, but is actually not necessarily reflective of those people that live in those pieces of properties. And so in their report they said it's very important that the Education Committee can remain in communication with the Taxation Committee and that these other tax programs that provide property tax relief are kept robust and meaningful because that further helps create that equitable um, access to education and make sure that everybody has a chance to um, stay in their homes without being um, taxed out of them through property taxes. Um, I just want to also uh, address the, the, what was mentioned earlier about Senator Langley having a bill. Um, well, first of all, that's been tabled by the Legislative Council and the Legislative Council doesn't meet for another month. And I'm sure that in terms of your timeline, that's not very encouraging news. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I will say from a personal note that um, based on comments that have been made here this evening, based on prior votes um, taken in the Appropriations Committee and taken um, in both chambers, I am not, I am not feeling comfortable nor um, optimistic necessarily that a separate um, bill to fund education would actually pass and be able to override a gov the governor's veto, who is the one who referred to the education spending as being bloated. Um, so <coughs> that, that's important to me. Um, I guess I'll leave it at, oh, and what a, well, so I think I stated earlier, I have been fighting for increased um, state funding of public education since I've arrived up in Augusta. I will continue to fight for that. It is part of our state tax policy. We cannot look at just tax conformity and income taxes and sales taxes without including the discussion of property taxes. That's, it, that our citizens pay property taxes as well as they do any of these other things and it needs to be part of that discussion. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So we have uh, three board members that still have questions. So I'm, I'm going to get everyone a chance before we go back to the same people who've had an opportunity, okay? So I'm going to go to Kate next, then Kelly and Christine. I want to thank you all for the work that you do, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. It seems to me like the majority of what we've been talking about tonight has been on sort of a macro level, an Augusta sort of top-down level, and that's obviously very important um, and the primary job that you all do, and I don't mean to discredit that. Um, but to sort of a adopt a military analogy, if I may, we're the infantry. We're on the front lines. We were elected by the citizens of Scarborough to create a budget that supports education in this, this town. Um, it was an incredibly contentious process last year. I think there were a lot of hurt feelings and, and a lot um, 
suffered as a result. So, so if I could just briefly take it from the macro to the micro and say to you all, we are entering this budget time again. We are still dealing with shortfalls. They will not be corrected this year. And so what can each of you pledge to this audience tonight that you all will do in support of education in Scarborough during this budget cycle? I think what I've already what I said earlier is that I'm going to continue to, to hope that we can have a separate measure and I think that there are many ways to make that happen. I don't think there's a, just only one path and one vehicle and um, I'm definitely hearing from my leadership that that is something that they are also interested in and they're continuing to discuss that um, with the leadership on the other side of the aisle. So I will be happy to if we can, if there is a way and there can be developed a vehicle to take some of that $65 million surplus, dedicate that to filling this gap to prevent the mill rate increase, then I would be more than happy to do that. But I'm not going to couple it with tax conformity. This is not my question. My question is what can you do to support us in our budget cycle right now as we try to pass a budget in the town of Scarborough that supports education for the next academic year? That's what that would do because you would have that certainty of the um, the funding, so it would help you create be able to create your budget without having to make cuts. Anyone else? Andrew. Yep. Uh, two weeks ago, I voted for the 23 million dollars in, in education funding. It faces further votes in the Senate. It'll come back down to the House, and I plan to to continue to vote for it. Um, I think it's important. And I will say I don't envy any of you having to do this budget process. If I had to do it, I would be absolutely terrified. But my recommendation to you would be that you take a good hard look at all of your resources available and look, for example, we've had a very, very warm winter. Take a look at your fuel, fuel budget and see if you have some extra money there. I would also consider that you've lost 100 students. Um, Scarborough spends 15,000 plus per student per year. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Based on the numbers that Susan's saying, 12. Is it 12? Okay. So, I mean, if you've if you've lost 100 students and you're at $12,000 per year, I know in my family, if one of my students, one of my kids is no longer in the house, my grocery budget's going to go down, my light bill's going to go down, so I would think that there would be some money there and in fuel savings, but I too am a taxpayer here, and I run into seniors, uh, senior citizens that are really, really concerned about the level of spending that we are paying, spending in our town, and I would ask you to please scrutinize that, that budget, because we really are all working together here. Thanks. Rebecca? Well, I, I, well, I served on the school board for six plus years, so I'm very well aware of what you're going through, which is why I've advocated every year that I've been there for increased state funding and moving us towards 55%, which is the will of the people, and we really need to start getting more serious about that and start making up some lost ground. Um, I would just say that I'm very cognizant of the fact that just because you have lower student numbers, that doesn't mean they're all in one grade and therefore you can lay off um, a teacher in every grade and that all of a sudden your energy costs go down because you don't have that many students. I know um, with my own personal experience it doesn't flow that way. And I also know that you have been faced year after year with decreased state funding because of the way because of the way the allocation methodology works, because of the fact that Scarborough's property valuation has remained stable when um, communities in northern Maine and rural Maine have suffered severe blows. Um, all I can say is the best way to provide relief to, the, to Scarborough is to get the state to fund more of its required share of local, I mean, of, of education funding. Um, and that, and what's frustrating for me is, is that 
I am, we are, a number of us are fighting for this $23 million just to keep the state share constant, not even moving up towards 55%. Um, but that's what I'm prepared to do this session. It won't solve it. It will cut your cost by in half, roughly, I believe. Um, I wish I could say I would go out there and fight for another $20 million, but I think you can tell by the, the, the tone of the discussion here amongst the legislators that that, that would probably be next. It would be um, pie in the sky and not truly honest um, about our ability to get you more relief. And I, I do want to point out that even if we do fill that gap, that $23 million, Scarborough is still going to have a shortfall because of the allocation. So um, we will not be made whole with the $1.5 million or $1.6 million. Either way, there's going to be a shortfall. Um, so I think that what that shortfall ends up being depends upon um, the, uh, how, how it all ends up being allocated at the end of the day, but it won't we won't make up the 1.6 million. Is that correct, That's Susan? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a question for you all. What is your projected or estimated budget for the next upcoming school year, the total dollar amount? Well, right now, we're just in the early stages of developing that, so we don't have, a, we don't have an exact number for you what, at this point. What, did, what, did, what was the, what was, um, I'm sorry, forgive me. I know it was in the 40s. What was the final amount that finally settled out the last, this, this current school year? 43.5 million. Okay. I can tell you one thing, um, just to give this a little bit of a perspective, uh, the loss that's being projected in terms of revenue mm -hmm. is greater than, so we would need greater than an additional 4% on that flat funded amount just to be flat funded and start from a level ground again. Mm -hmm. so, so it would be an increase of 4% would just get us to being flat funded and starting from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gives you a sense of a perspective in terms of percentage. Mm -hmm. I think you can see the challenges we have with baseline increases as well as, as you all have here too. And um, I mean, I don't want to get on a soapbox here a little bit, but I think you know my position on maybe starting new programs that we haven't had previously that then do affect the baseline going forward. And so specifically as an example would be the laptop program that was decided to be expanded. and and in my mind and a lot of my constituents have been had questioned why was that not brought to a vote it was more than four hundred thousand dollars and any in the town charter seemed to say that unless the town charter has changed that I'm not aware of that the, those large expenses would be brought to the voters for for approval because there are ongoing costs and it's more than just the replacement costs too there's staff involved in that kind of thing mm -hmm. so that that does factor in and 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 I think Representative Vashon actually had a very good point that the fuel oil prices have dropped and with the mild winter as well there may be some some cost savings there I know that Representative Foley who serves the the um, district down in Wells said that his his school district found a tremendous savings in their budget in the fuel oil piece of their the, um, this winter those so are certainly all things that we've we're on top of all of that. Well, let's move on because we, we have two other board members still wanting to ask questions and we're closing in on that hour very quickly. So, yes, Mrs. Murphy. Christine, do you want to go first since you haven't asked a sure. question? Uh, Ms. Bashan, you mentioned that we should have gotten on the list for the school funding for the Wentworth project. We were on the list. And we were either, it, this was in 2009, we were either number 85 or 89. If we had waited for the state to fund that project, we'd be looking at, let's see, they fund three, maybe four a year. We'd be looking at something like 25 plus years before the project would be funded. So were we supposed to just sit and let that school building and let our students and the families of our students have kids be in there and be sick from mold? and have sealed up windows because there was asbestos in there and all kinds of myriad of other problems that I can't even recall. Were we just supposed mm -hmm. to sit back and just Don't let it happen, leave it alone? Yeah. You know. Don't argue. 
as you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. that's just a comment for you on that one. And then um, correct me, please, because I've heard some other numbers being kicked around, but I thought that there was $72 million in surplus that's available currently that is potentially going to go into the rainy day fund. I've heard some of you say 60-something. I've heard some say there was only 50-something. Excuse me, it's 67 <coughs> this year and five next year. So it's not in the out years. It's a one-time wonder. It's, it's not. But it's a total of 72 million. It's a total of 72 million over a two-year period. Okay. okay. And why, one more question, um, why was there no supplemental budget this year? Was that because people didn't want to work across the aisle together? The governor or did not submit one. The governor just chose not to submit one and nobody can force him? Correct. That's correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll say, so in... Mr. Ryer has some information oh, on the website. Okay. Well, I just, I just would clarify a bit. I believe you <coughs> applied in the 0405 cycle for new, you know, for, to get on the list than you were, and I don't know the exact number, but I know it was very high on that list. Um, it's important to remember that on, the, on that list of 70 or so schools, 20 were eventually funded off that list. Another list was produced in 2010 and 11. Uh, again, there were 60 odd schools on that list, and we so far have funded say we, the state funded um, 12 and are considering more on that list at this moment, there will be another round. So it's very hard to tell where Scarborough would have ended up because out of that list that we produce each year and maintain for four or five, there will be school systems that come off the list for one reason or another. So it's hard to know where you would have been. and the case that I'm sure you made was that it was important to move forward mm -hmm. and there was no way of knowing exactly when that could occur but that's that that will be seen under current law as a local decision that you made to go ahead and fund that project mm -hmm. on your own but it's 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 no small I mean it's four million a year as near as I could tell that you're committing to that project for 20 years from the time it was decided right. locally to build it so it is significantly impacting your annual budget, but you may well, I'm not trying to judge whether it was worthwhile or not, it, uh, it may well have been worthwhile to do that. Ultimately, when it was rated back in 2004, um, those needs could have increased and changed as time went on, would have been a different place on new lists, so it's hard to predict what would have happened, but I just want to clarify that. But it's May I? Yes. It started the year after the middle school opened. So it, it, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we started with that list. And, uh, you know, the people would come down from the state on an annual basis and say, oh, this is a nice, clean school. And there wasn't anything that they could identify as critical at that point in time, and we had a contractor in this town uh, who wondered why we needed a new school, and I took him through the school several years ago, and he said, my goodness, this is the cleanest dump I've ever seen, <laughs> and it was well maintained. It just was deteriorating, and to the point where it was causing serious physical problems to staff and children. Let's go. I think the point just needs to be made that that was a decision that was made townwide. Absolutely. And Absolutely. in absence of that vote having been um, a positive vote in terms of de deciding to build the school, that we had in effect already taken ourselves off the list because we had not updated our application. So we really would have been in a, in a problem. Um, the retirement of the debt does bring some money. I mean, it's hitting us in the formula, but I would also think that it also is returning money because we're no longer making that payment um, on the middle school, I believe it is. Right. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that is really affecting us in the uh, mm -hmm. formula. Yes, Mrs. Murphy. Okay, so yes. I just wanted a couple things about Wentworth and then moving on. It was overwhelmingly approved by voters. It was desperately needed. It's a better school than we would have gotten 
for less money than if it was state funded. So everyone should be applauding that decision that we took it off the state's bankrolls. Anyway, we built a better school, better for the town that will last longer and more. The middle school project was state funded and that has been an inefficient building from the day it opened. It's had portables because of the way that state funded schools you're only allowed to look five years back and five years forward for population projections. And obviously Scarborough blew that out of the water. As soon as it was built, it was built for 600 something students and 800 students were moving in on day one. So let's drop Wentworth because that's a huge success actually. Um, my point is I feel like there's been a lot of condescension among um, some of the representatives here today that we don't understand how education policy works in Augusta. Highly untrue. We are all elected to a school board. We got here because we want to be here, because we are interested in it. We advocate in Augusta every year. We go to um, state school board conventions for more information. We are on it. We know how the funding works. We do not believe that students in zip code 04074 are more special than any student in the whole state of Maine. We've never had that opinion. We understand that we are fortunate in Scarborough, that we have a high tax valuation, and we are never going to get 55% funded in Scarborough. We get it. What we are asking is for our representatives to look at what exists in Augusta right now for school funding and find a way that you could perhaps propose legislation that would help everybody, including if you have a privately locally funded school building, that you get some accounting for that when the allocations are made. That yes, the state didn't pay for it, but it was a, a debt taken, up, taken on nonetheless and responsibly so, and there should be some accounting for that. That's one. We're asking for your advocacy because Scarborough is the biggest loser year after year. We get it. We are doing better than Bucksport. We are very lucky. We know that. We're not asking for dollars to be taken from Bucksport. We are asking for more dollars to be included to the entire state budget because a rising tide lifts all boats and we would be one of the boats even if we're not going to go as high as Bucksport. We're just asking for some advocacy for all students in Maine so there's more funding to go around and our tiny piece of the pie would get incrementally bigger. So the budget burden on local taxpayers in the form of property taxes would be incrementally less. We are asking more and more of our property taxpayers in Scarborough every year because our piece from Augusta is either staying the same or it's shrinking and we understand that other places are worse off than us. We are not asking for those dollars to come here instead. We are asking for more overall, and we're asking for your help with that. Thank so you. I should have mentioned that um, exactly what you're talking about. That was actually an idea that I had um, floated by a few people a couple of weeks ago in terms of um, finding a vehicle to add an amendment on to deal with and recognize the, um, when a municipality has decided to privately um, pay for a school and to have that, I mean, I, I have to tell you that I, I think that there are so few communities that take that burden on that, you know, it's certainly a discussion worth having, but it's probably not going to be successful. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have that discussion. I'm happy to be that champion, but I don't want anyone to get their hopes up about the um, prospects of that. And I think that probably Senator Millett would agree with me that that's unlikely to be successful. <laughs> but I, 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 I do think we should have the debate and, um, you know, that, that communities around the state should recognize that, you know, there are some places that have taken that burden on themselves. And South Portland, actually, which you also represent, is in a similar situation. So hopefully that's something we could work together on. Senator Millett, did you want to make a oh. comment? Oh, so I wish I could say I, that that would be something that would successfully get through, but um, I can already hear it in the Education Committee. And the argument against um, such a proposal would be the following. 
that, um, let's say Scarborough is cost conscious, effective and efficient in their building of a, of, of a new facility for their schools, but another community somewhere else in the state of Maine decided to just go for broke and spent um, a factor of 10 beyond what you folks did. We all will contribute to their extravagances mm -hmm. in the building of their facility more than we would to yours. And it sets up some really negative dynamics. I, was, I would just add to that that I think there could be a stipulation if such legislation were ever proposed that if it was built to state standards, which <coughs> Wentworth was. We used a further out projection for population, but we had the number of classrooms required by the state. We had um, the gym size, the office, the nursing facility. Every, we followed state standards, including the much maligned art project, which would have been more had it been a state-funded building. So I think that could be a, a, a potentiality there, that if you're following state standards, through no fault of your own, you're not on the list because Scarborough is a fortunate town. We weren't going to get a school in time. We followed state standards and built a school and were punished for it for having the debt. That's all. Another approach, and Mr. Ryer is going to know that this is a very familiar tune for me, and it says Deputy Commissioner Bowden, is just to increase the number of schools that get funded. And the state has the capacity to increase the funds that are available for construction. This current administration does not support that. Um, so we could try putting in some really complicated laws that people are going to hate us for in about five years, or we could just simply authorize more funds be available for construction. I, I, I don't know which one's better, but it's kind of where we are today. Thank you. So now we've, we've been at this for over an hour, and we want to thank each one of you for being here and letting us, you know, challenge you with some questions and asking you to step up for our town. Um, you know, it's hard work. It's, it's difficult work, um, both on the school board side and you as representatives, I'm sure, are challenged as well in the work that you do. The fact is, We've all stepped up to be elected people who are willing to support our town and find whatever avenues we can find to make changes in our community. So thank you for that work. So at this time, I'm going to allow um, anyone in the community who wishes to make a comment. This is not going to be an opportunity for you to ask a question and get answers. That should be done through email to our legislators or to the school board, whomever you wish to direct it. But we, we, we do want to give you the chance to have something to say. You would come up to the podium over here, um, state your name and your address, and make your comment. Anyone interested in coming forward should please do that at this time. Please limit your, response, your comments to about two minutes. And also, if you uh, can listen to each other's comments so that we, if you want to have something to say, we'd like to hear new information rather than repeated comments. So that would be helpful and um, efficient use of time. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm, De I'm Deborah Key Shortman. I um, just want to state my sources are from um, the Portland Press Herald and various um, elected official sites. Um, I understand the point about the mill towns and Scarborough being very wealthy. However, the state's funding of per pupil cost for Scarborough is significantly less than Falmouth, Cumberland, and Cape Elizabeth, for example. Those are not struggling mill towns, um, and I think we need to do something about that. Um, I think it's also, as talked about earlier, ridiculous that the Maine Revenue Forecasting Committee announced this past week that it expects the State General Revenue Fund to exceed expectations, as we said, by $73 million, um, and that LePage wants it to all go to a rainy day fund. The rainy day fund has already rebounded to $111 million, which is close to pre-recession levels. 131 schools are standing to lose $20 million for next year's budgets. 
ours, as we were said, is 1.5 million. So $73 million available to fix the problem, $20 million to the schools. There's a lot extra after that. It can, you know, we can compromise. How about half to the schools, half to the rainy day fund? So both sides get a little bit. Um, that half of that 73 would easily cover the school state funding so that no cuts would have to be made to Scarborough, including which, as we said, was the 1.5 million. So I just put out that compromise and hope you consider it. Thank you. I'm Alec Mayberduke uh, from Old Millbrook. Um, and I think I just wanted to say, you know, I think, you know, most of us can agree that education is probably one of the biggest, best, you know, investments that we can make, you know, not only from like an economic perspective, as we're always hearing from employers in the state of Maine that, you know, we need to have a better trained workforce, but also because every dollar that we put into, you know, developing people, um, you know, as full human beings, uh, the earlier in life, the more that it, you know, can stave off a huge number of problems down the road. I think one of my concerns about the debate in Augusta right now is that we constantly see that there's always money for tax cuts, constantly. Um, you know, I think we've cut the top rate, you know, twice um, in the last what, six years now. Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, the, the argument that there's just not enough money for this is disingenuous. Um, and, you know, there's always seems to be enough money for tax cuts. There never seems to be enough money for schools, and I find that incredibly troubling. Um, I, uh, you know, I want to agree and applaud the statements tonight that it would be wrong for, you know, us to in any way be suggesting that we want to rob poor districts. I appreciate the comments from uh, 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 school board member Murphy and from Senator Bulk to that end. I, I definitely don't think, you know, that should be anybody's objective, but I do think that we should really be focusing, as many other people said tonight, that we should put as much money into the formula to make sure that it can have the best benefit for everybody. Um, I also just want to say, you know, I think, uh, you know, for this whole question about the rainy day fund or education, um, that, you know, Moody's uh, has also, which is credit uh, agency, um, has also raised really big red flags about, you know, the impact of not uh, sufficiently funding uh, revenue sharing and 55% education funding. Um, and you can find that, you know, Google it, it's in their report. They've, read that, they've raised that as a red flag for the state. It's not just the rainy day fund, it's also municipal funding that they've flagged as being a, uh, 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 inadequate. Um, so, I, you know, I think a little bit of just the process point about amendments, again, I find this a little bit frustrating and disingenuous, you know, the idea that, like, nobody would ever support uh, an amendment ever again from the floor, you know, just seems uh, ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I just urge everybody to really time, you know, get to work funding 55% education funding and to, um, yeah, you know, if that means that we don't fund tax cuts, um, then we don't fund tax cuts. We have to start making some, you know, priorities for our children. Thank you. I am Kristen Allen at 34 Woodfield Drive, and my message is really simple. Um, one of the uh, phrases used tonight was the will of the people, and so I just wanted to tell my legislators that the will of this person is that education be moved up in the priority list. I don't agree with getting rid of other priorities too, but I think it's been left to the bottom of the list a little bit too long and we need to get to work. So, thank you. Doug Friedman, 17 Lillian Way. Um, this is the first time I've ever been to a school board committee meeting or to a, you know, a group meeting like this. And I found it very interesting because I presume that our legislators at the state level are not here normally because of the way you all interact. <laughs> um, the reason I came is I got a pamphlet in the mail from Amy Volk. Um, and one of the things she said in here was these fine people were invited to this meeting. It was very interesting. We had very little cor correspondence or discussion with these people. They do the, at the state level, and yet we didn't really use um, their expertise, but so be it. Um, one of the things Amy said was, I want to provide the facts. And I didn't hear a lot of facts today. There's a lot of rhetoric today, a lot of um, 
uh, information that's going around that, you know, doesn't directly apply to us very much. And, you know, I, I know I can't ask questions, but I'm going to put some rhetorical things out there and I'll find out the answers later. I believe I heard that the budget for the town is $43.5 million, plus or minus. I presume that includes the debt funding on the schools. That's everything. I'm not sure how many students we have in this town. I think about 3,000, something like that. So if you do the math, that's about 14,000 per student. I think we heard that the, the, there were a number of 12,000 per student. I presume that's the <coughs> funding, not including the debt funding. So I, I'm guessing that's what that is. So um, I also am trying to understand, we have a $43.5 million budget, but I believe if I look in the town annual report, we get about $4.5 million from the state. Is that number correct? I'm not sure. I think it's correct. I'm not sure. So $4.5 million is about a tenth of our total expenditures. Now, we're, and, and I wanted to know, you know, at the state level, how much funding is given to the entire state? We get 4.5. The entire state gets how much? How much is that? Is that a, is that a billion dollars? What is it? A, so say a billion dollars. Right. So you're talking about increases of $23 million for the whole state. That's 2%. So for us, the 2% would be 2% on $4.5 million. That's about $90,000 if, if it was equally spread out over the state. So, you, you know, the discussions around some of these numbers are not really relevant compared to the totality of our budget. And so, you know, I, I need to do the research myself. I'll admit that. 55% funding, that would be, I, I think you, you, you said that we're spending $1,500 per pupil is coming from the state. If we got 55% and the cost is $12,000 a student, we'd get $6,000 a student. And clearly we're nothing like that. So I'll do my research, but, you know, we need the facts and we need the numbers for our town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karam Durda. I live in 6 Hayes Tax Circle. From what I've been hearing, I, I see three things that I would like my representatives to work on. First, philosophically speaking, there seems to be a significant difference between how I view the basic human right of every student over here to get a very, very good education compared to some of the comments I've heard. I find it's an abrogation of your responsibility not to think of them first. So there's a philosophical problem, and maybe there needs to be having a conversation that we need to have more on a regular basis to understand where some of our representatives do not and are not willing to make that an utmost priority. I'd like to understand more why that difference exists. Secondly, it's tactical. I understand the social contract. I believe in it. It is an inalienable right of us as a state that we have to hold out for each other. But, have you looked at some inefficiencies that exist in our system? We know that the DHS has, has some miserable track record of efficiency. Are all the tax increment or the tax benefits that businesses like myself get, are they effective? Are there some inefficiencies there? If belt piping is needed on the education basis, on the education front, are there others on others' front? whether it be our committee members on the judiciary, the BETR, Health and Human Services, can we, over a course of time, say in the next two, three months, hear from you how we can save some money elsewhere so that we can change the conversation from a zero-sum game to let's see where else something exists. I have not heard that at all today. I would urge our reps to look in there. The last is strategic. You know, we've heard, yes, the recession 2008. Yes, we heard 2011. Don't you guys look ahead? Do you believe in strategic planning? Do you believe in looking some at some trends, economic, macro, or <coughs> micro, and say to yourselves, we should do certain things that are 10 years out? And oh, by the way, I'm willing to put my reputation, integrity, intellectual acumen on the line and not care if it comes to fruit. And so let's do it. Actually, in the early 2000s, you guys did that. The laptop program is your legacy for doing that, for thinking 10, 15 years down the road. 
<laughs> and there are other things that you guys did way back then that have borne fruit. But for some reason, you guys have let go of that. It's utmostly inherently disappointing that you guys can't think beyond another year or even two. So if you're smart enough, and God willing, I know we're smart enough, you should be able to look at some trends, whether it's a declining student population, the misery of the business conditions, the lack of DECD getting more nickels, all of that. Why don't you look 10 years out and inspire me to do things to help you? That's, I think, <laughs> the really important crux of the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie Fellows, Orchard Street. I wasn't sure I was even going to stand up and talk at all, but I just had a couple <coughs> of quick comments. As somebody who has spent her entire professional career working for legislators um, at different levels of government, I feel like I have a really good appreciation of the challenges that you guys face in your work, and I wanted to thank you all for stepping up and doing it, because uh, it's so important and it's so hard. Uh, so thank you all. And I just wanted to get on the record um, expressing my support for investment in education to the extent that we are able to do so. Uh, I feel strongly that our system can still stand to um, really make some gains um, <coughs> because over the last few years it's really been a lot of losses. So I'm, I'm hoping to see gains. Thank you. My name is Ann Valente, and I, I um, live at 10 Sagebrush Drive. I, too, wasn't planning to speak, but um, I'm kind of living with a double whammy. I'm a teacher, and I teach in Cape Elizabeth, and um, I feel like I'm living a nightmare. Um, with all of the cuts and things we're dealing with there, I see the same thing happening here with my own children who go to school here, um, and I, I would invite some of you to walk through classrooms and to speak with teachers to find out what we deal with day to day. And um, we've already dealt with cuts in support staff and, and cuts with um, you know, professional development funding. Um, we're writing letters to our parents to supply school supplies for our children in our classrooms. We've cut after school activities, foreign language, there have been multiple cuts, and, um, and it's already really difficult. So the thought of even losing more um, is really hard for me, um, especially when I think of my own children in this district and what I deal with in my professional career. Um, so I really would encourage you to speak to teachers and get that input. and. Um, and Senator Millett, I thank you for your service and thanks for helping our children. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hillary Durgan. I live at uh, on Sequoia Lane. I wasn't speak I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so I don't have anything articulate planned. Um, but I just wanted to quickly um, say that I support increasing the state funding so that our towns are not, um, or at least our town specifically, isn't um, forced to increase our property taxes over and over again. Um, and again, I would, I would never want to take anything away from any other children in the state or um, people who need it more than we do. We are very lucky, but um, again, just reiterating, if we put more in at the top, it's going to all trickle down and we're going to get more as well. Um, and I also wanted to thank all of you for all your hard work. Um, our school board members are, have all been elected by us. They're all very smart people. Um, and to patronize them by telling them to look at fuel costs and um, you know how much a pencil costs is a little bit disappointing. So um, I just want to give you my support on that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing none, once again, I want to thank all of you, all our legislators and, and all our um, citizens who have come, uh, people who live in town who just had an interest coming this evening. Uh, what? 
May I just ask who gave us the gratitude beads? Because, oh, yeah. boy, I, I am really trying to remember it every day to be very grateful. The uh, so Scarborough Kindness day. Project. Very nice. Thank you. So we're going to take a five-minute break now so people can leave if they wish to, and then we'll continue on with the school board meeting. Donna, can I just say, we, and I actually have some handouts here that um, Mr. Ryer and Ms. Bodwin were kind enough to bring to us. Um, they had been expecting to make a presentation, but at the last Thank minute you, there was a change of plans, so the information is here. And thank you, Susan Bowden and Jim Ryer as well for coming. We appreciate you being here.
6.2, the 24-month improvement plan update. Um, okay, I, I promise to make this very fast. Uh, the 24-month, what we call student-centered plan, um, has continued to guide the work and focus our, our work and, and identify our priorities um, as school leaders uh, since the spring of last year, April. Uh, the limited time for an update tonight present, presented me a great opportunity uh, to really introduce uh, to you our new progress tracking and progress monitoring system. I was going to actually do this electronically, but it proved to be more ambitious than I might have been ready for at 9 p.m. So I chose to just, and I'm getting thumbs up from some of my friends out there, uh, because they would not want to see me fumble through that. Um, I'm actually pretty good at it. I, I just want to say I'm actually pretty good at it. And they can attest to my Prezi skills. So, um, so what you're looking at here um, in this uh, blue, little blue item uh, is uh, the new dashboards. Um, dashboards uh, like the ones that you're looking at for, these are three of a possible 14 improvement targets are now uh, being uploaded and being updated for K-2, for Wentworth, for middle school, high school, for special education, and for central office. This is essentially all of the components of the 24-month improvements uh, plan. Um, when we come back to you and we do a formal update, uh, we will basically be utilizing these dashboards to report out on our progress. Uh, I think um, what you will notice is that it carries uh, and focuses um, each of the long-term uh, improvement uh, goals. Um, it identifies what the um, uh, seven or eight targets are for the 24-month period. It identifies specifically what you're looking at is a, a couple of pages or a couple of shots from the central office dashboard, which basically identifies uh, the objective that we have under that particular goal and under that particular um, target and um, identifies metrics. In the far right hand corner you see organizational strategies, which is really mostly meant to be kept as our own notes as we um, capture the work that we're doing or the strategies that we're using to really achieve um, these particular outcomes. The success metrics, as you can see, is really um, very much like uh, what uh, some of our students are seeing and what our t uh, teachers are receiving in terms of feedback around are we at a beginning stage, um, in other words, is it a planning stage, or are we, are we even reassessing that objective? Um, the D is a developing, so we're partially implemented. Uh, a is applying, so we're fully implemented. And I is innovating, which is really um, at the point of re reflection and re refinement in terms of the work that has been done. So um, you can see that the status on uh, this particular page uh, is all uh, applying. The next page, I think, is probably something a little bit less. And so you see that as, as you just look at these few pages, um, there's some uh, capture of the current state of affairs in, in terms of that particular work. This is only central office. It's only for, for three of the uh, target areas. And so when, when we're now, uh, when we look across this entire system, we're able to actually take a look and get a status report on where we are. Um, it's been made uh, so that people um, in the buildings, the uh, responsible uh, school leaders, can actually go in and change the status. They can add a new strategy that's been uh, designed, et cetera. This one is just one that I've played with a little bit just to show you an example. Um, we have in a couple of weeks a session coming up where we will all sit and basically go through and, and download and update these. And as I was playing with it today, I, I, I'm not really good, uh, although I said I was. I'm, I'm pretty good at it. And I, I get into it and I told, actually I told Kelly, I'm, you know, it's, once you get in there, it's, it's pretty easy to move around. But this is um, to be, uh, the credit is to be given for, uh, for the development of this very customized system uh, to our um, in instructional, our technology um, integrators. Uh, they took on this project, they embraced it, they loved this kind of stuff, and they just went to town. And as you can see, it's very simple. It's a, it, it is a snapshot uh, in terms of what a dashboard is supposed to be. And so there you have it. And I wanted to just give you that update. And we'll be back in March to present our progress report 
to you and you'll be um, looking at dashboards at that time. Ultimately, what we would like to do is to get a level of comfort, feel that they're updated, and have them accessible to the public so they can see the status on anything that we're working on. And in terms of uh, uh, transparency, I think that's a, a, a big move. Uh, I'll move to item 6.3, mm -hmm. which is the uh, fiscal year 17 budget update. Um, the development of the uh, 2017 level services budget is in its final draft. Uh, essentially, I said this is a one-woman job in consultation with every school leader who manages la uh, line items. So it's essentially been uh, the burden that Kate uh, takes on and carries through this period of the budget development process. There's uh, much attention, on, uh, and I don't need to say, uh, given our session that we've just had on the projected loss in state revenue to Scarborough, as that loss, as I said before, um, would require approximately a 4% increase to the, to the budget uh, just to get to a level services, um, uh, a true level services starting point. So it's a big hit. Uh, um, the Leadership Council has been and will continue to cost out and prioritize new initiatives and proposals. Um, uh, the board has asked us to continue to look and to identify where we should be growing and where we should be innovating and where we should be adding uh, new services and we certainly plan to deliver on that. Um, so uh, we are in the early stages of developing a student needs based budget projection um, and we are next week meeting in phase by phase sessions for a deeper review of each of the proposals from uh, the phases and the departments. Everything is, uh, I guess the bottom line is everything is moving along as it should be and we are on track as it relates to the overall budget development schedule. Uh, which then brings me to 6.4, dates of importance, and I'll go through these quickly, um, uh, but I can uh, make a copy of this, uh, um, these notes available to you. Uh, on March 10th uh, at 2 p.m. is the next Joint Town Council and School Board Finance Committee meeting. On that same day, um, there will likely be, I think Jody, uh, that's a school board day, uh, March 10th. Mm -hmm. Six to seven, I am sa suggesting that there's probably going to be a school board finance committee meeting um, yes. in advance of the regular meeting. Yes. Then we move to the 24th of March, uh, two to three is um, another uh, joint town council and school board finance committee meeting. Uh, these things have been scheduled regularly and I think that's been very helpful for us to all have those on our calendar. There was supposed to be one today that we felt that we could um, let slide, so we're picking up on the 10th. Um, and then we go to April 6th, which is um, a big day. Um, that is actually a town council meeting. It's um, 7 p.m. and it is the 2017 uh, town and school joint budget presentation. It's when Tom and I together roll out uh, what constitutes the town budget. Uh, the following day, the board has their regular meeting, and that would be their first reading of the FY17 school budget. First reading meaning the starting point. And given what I'm I heard tonight, um, it's good that we would just regard it as a starting point because there will be lots of things that we will not know. I'm just saying, I'm guessing. Um, and on. Uh, so that's on April uh, 7th and then on April 8th, so we've got like a trifecta of meetings. Um, it, April 8th is noon to 4.30, it's the school budget workshop and that's when the entire leadership council comes together with the school board and we invite our friends on the town council to join us um, 12 noon to 4 p.m. in this building and that is, um, it, that is really the walkthrough of the school budget um, as we will know it at that particular time. So is that a Friday? I'm it's sorry. Friday. It is Saturday. Saturday. Friday. 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 Yeah. I, I'm hearing that it is a Friday. <coughs> uh, the 8th is a Friday. <laughs> it is 12 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And those are <coughs> items uh, 6 Two through six four. Very good, thank you. Seven point oh executive session, seven point one. Do I have a motion to go into executive session pursuant to one MRSA subsection four oh five six D to discuss contract negotiations 
between the board and the Scarborough Education Association. Not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? Seven. Thank you. We are adjourned.